everyone, it's Matthew Griffin, your host for today as we go into the latest science and technology news. Now, this is from my blog. This is the fanaticalfuturist.com website. So if you want to follow along with me, just go there, check the date, and then you can sort of explore the different news articles that uh, I put up there. So these are some of the things that I've seen over the past couple of weeks that have really piqued my interest. So let's get going. Now, um, over the past 10 years, we've seen a lot of hype over the fact that Moore's Law is dying. Now, Moore's Law basically is the rule that the cost performance of computing doubles every 18 months. Now, on the one hand, it's not necessarily dying because our ability to create smaller transistors is being challenged. We've actually created transistors that are 3 nanometers, 2 nanometers, 1 nanometer, 0 0.5, 0 0.25, 0 0.1, and even 0 nanometers in size. Yes, 0 nanometers in size. Uh, and this is as we start moving from silicon-based computing to quantum computing, neuromorphic computing, biological and DNA computing, and so on and so forth. Um, however, Moore's law has been dying more because every time the the fab plants like Intel, TSMC, so on and so forth, SMIC in China, want to create computer chips that have smaller transistor sizes, it costs them about $30 billion to build a new fab. So anyway, as Moore's law has been slowing down for more economic reasons than technological reasons over the past couple of years. Jensen Huang, who is the CEO of NVIDIA, has just recently come out and said that their GPUs are actually beating Moore's Law. Now, if you want to beat Moore's Law, it's not just a case of trying to pack more transistors onto the silicon. In, in NVIDIA's case, they've been building out a vertical suite of tools, basically, that goes on top of that. So they've got their CUDA software development platform, uh, they've got their computer chips and everything else. So uh, that's kind of a good news story. Now, over the next sort of five years, NVIDIA estimate that the performance of their GPUs will increase a million fold. So that is one million fold. So we still have a lot of scaling to do. Uh, moving over to OpenAI, OpenAI's Sam Altman says quite happily, that they know, now know how to build AGI, except it doesn't actually tell anyone. Um, now, what we can actually guess here is, I think there's a couple of things going on. So when you have a look at ChatGPT and GPT-4, they're made up of what we call a master of experts model. So you essentially have one large LLM at the top, and then you have lots of smaller multi-billion parameter models underneath that. We see that with uh, Llama 3 from Meta, where the the smaller models are generally like 80 billion parameters, and there are lots of them. So we get to GPT-4 today because we've got lots of 80 billion parameter models that are all great in their own way, that are then kind of orchestrated and controlled by a master LLM. Now, when we have a look at AGI, AGI is very much about cross-domain knowledge and all that kind of stuff. Now, there are a couple of benchmarks. There's the ACI AGI benchmark, and so far, GPT-4 and Zero have been beating a lot of the AGI benchmarks that we've actually seen out there. So, building AGI, it looks like one of the secret sources is going to be introducing time. So when you really root around the Arvix research papers and everything else, when we have a look at scaling artificial intelligence, the traditional way that we scale artificial intelligence is lots of data, lots of compute, and bigger and bigger artificial intelligence models. Now, there's been a lot of talk similarly about artificial intelligence hitting a wall because we just can't keep scaling all of these in the way that we need to. However, a little while ago, there was an artificial intelligence model called Chinchilla. And it was a 50 billion parameter model that beat much, much bigger models, including Llama, which was a 405 billion parameter model. 
So researchers in the US, but also especially in China, we'll come on to that in some of the other videos, have figured out that if you want to scale artificial intelligence massively, then it's not just about compute and data and big models. It's also about time and time is reasoning. So if you've noticed a lot of the OpenAI models now use chain of thought reasoning, that is the secret source to creating AGI or at least getting closer to AGI because it allows us to create AGI-like models without having to infinitely scale up the amount of data that they're increasingly running out of to train these things on, etc., etc. So Sam Altman may be talking to the investors and going, I know how to build AGI, give me more money. Um, but, you know, I think we may know how we get there. Uh, now, sticking to the AGI theme, a little while ago I reported that OpenAI's board's definition of artificial, in general, artificial general intelligence was the point in time when AI beats all humans at all economically valuable work. Now that's terrifying for a start because that is the end of the global services industry, let alone anything else. However, Microsoft and OpenAI recently sat down together and they've agreed a commercial definition of AGI, which is the point in time when artificial general intelligence is able to make a hundred billion dollars. Okay, now that sounds slightly odd, slightly scary. However, it's not necessarily unexpected because both OpenAI and Google DeepMind a little while ago said that they needed a new Turing test for AI. And both organizations suggested that the new Turing test for artificial intelligence is the point in time when AI can make its own multi-billion dollar business. And it's not doing too badly on that trajectory, as I've talked about in lots of my keynotes. So this definition here could very much be tied to artificial intelligence building its own multi-billion dollar business that generates a hundred billion dollars in profits. That is an interesting definition. Um, now moving to slightly sort of dumber robots, but uh, when we have a look at Saudi Arabia, Saudi Arabia have been trying to build a 170 kilometer long linear city. Um, they struggled with financing for a variety of different reasons, and so now it's going to be a 2.5 kilometer long linear city. This is the line, which is part of the NEON project. And by 2030, they're hoping to get to that 2.5 kilometers. Um, so good luck there. Um, in order to accelerate the development of the line, they're now using robots to do rebar. Um, so it doesn't exactly sound particularly interesting and exciting, but when we have a look at construction, we're 3D printing buildings, we're doing all kinds of different things. And um, bearing in mind that Neom is using up 30% of all of the world's steel and concrete, anything that speeds up the development of this futuristic city um, is really interesting because all of these little developments over time could have a very big impact on the cost, the deliverable of the project and so on and so forth. Uh, Coming to China and the aerospace and defense sector, uh, one of the big problems that the vast majority of the world's militaries now face is how to defend themselves against hypersonic missile threats. So a hypersonic missile is something that travels at more than Mach 5. Um, and one of the big problems that we have is, on the one hand, identifying something traveling at Mach 5 and above, um, tracking it, and then shooting it down. Now, there are a couple of different ways we can try to shoot down hypersonic missiles. We can use terahertz technologies to break through the plasma shields around a hypersonic weapon. Uh, we can use artificial intelligence to, combined with sensor fusion, to try to track the hypersonic weapon. And in the United States, they've actually suggested that AI autonomous, that autonomous artificial intelligences are used to track and shoot down AI, these hypersonic weapons. China is not only backing the 6G and terahertz 
approach to tracking hypersonic weapons as they enter the Earth's atmosphere or as they scoot along the surface of the waves of the ocean. Um, they've taken a technology from 2006 that was developed by an Australian inventor and it's called Metal Storm. So it's called Metal Storm because it fires 450,000 rounds a minute and one of the biggest problems that we see with the phalanx guns, if you scaled up a phalanx gun, and this is much, much faster than the American phalanx weapons, um, the barrels would, the barrel of the gun would simply melt. So in this particular case, the Chinese are using hot swappable uh, bullet cartridges, which mean that they can have a sustained firing rate of 450,000 rounds a minute to essentially create a metal storm that protects the uh, the PLA and the Chinese Navy against threats. Um, then we've got Chinese enterprises. So I do a lot of sort of foresight work basically when we talk about China. Um, no surprise here, Chinese enterprises are leaning into the use of generative artificial intelligence to identify cyber threats, uh, go through cyber intel and so on and so forth. Um, we've seen that basically with Google. So Google managed to double the productivity of their SOC by using generative artificial intelligence uh, in combination with their human analysts and so on and so forth. Uh, again, staying with China. So uh, China have been leaning quite heavily on a NASA technology. So I reported a little while ago that NASA had created a rotation detonation engine capable of Mach 16. And unlike most hypersonic and most jet propulsion systems where you don't want an explosion within the jet or within the, the jet engine, a rotation detonation engine has thousands of small detonations per second and that accelerates vehicles to well into hypersonic territory. So the Chinese seem to be doing some really interesting things when it comes to perfecting the reliability and the sustainability in terms of the sustaining the performance, not their, their green, uh, of hypersonic uh, propulsion systems. Um, again, sticking with China. Um, a little while ago, uh, it was kind of like an accident um, to sixth generation Chinese fighter jets showed up at the same time. Funny that. Um, now, when we actually have a look at this, you've got little videos in all of these blogs that I write. Um, this looks like the DARPA X-36 crane. Um, however, if I can actually show you, these are tailless. So you can see here, there's no tail on uh, on these sixth generation fighter jets. Now, sixth generation fighter jets will, like the American NGAD program, will ultimately replace things like the F-22s and the F-25s in the American military. These are the J-50s and the J-36 from China. Um, there are a lot of countries around the world that are heavily investing in producing sixth generation fighter jets. Uh, however, Elon Musk has also said there's no point really creating sixth generation fighter jets with a human in them because you should just take the human out. So uh, if you're going to have a watch of this video, you can start understanding a little bit more about some of the technologies that we are using today to create the next generation of multi-trillion dollar fighter jets. Um, a cryopreservation facility. Yeah, a little while ago, you know, if we step back to the 80s and the 90s, there was a lot of talk about cryopreservation. We saw a lot of science fiction movies coming out. Uh, a little while ago, we managed to put embryos basically into forced hibernation, uh, which was actually successful. So when we talk about putting uh, embryos into cryo sleep, this is literally for the purposes of deep space travel, but also so you can put people into cryo sleep today who maybe have died or they've suffered some catastrophic uh, injury with the hope that in 100, 200 years time, we will have the technology to bring them back to life. So this company is called Time Shift. Uh, and if you want to, you can go and buy yourself a pod as we sit in Futurama 
and you can go and cryopreserve yourself when you die in the hope that in the year 2500 you're going to get woken up like Cinderella. Um, now, a little while ago, basically, we actually saw a girl in the UK who died of cancer and she was granted permission by the courts to go into cryo. Um, so this is one of the first cryo stories that I've seen pop up in the past probably three or four years. So maybe cryogenics is making a comeback in 2025. And then the last three, um, Anduril. So we're seeing the development of fully autonomous underwater vehicles like fully autonomous submarines. We saw uh, the Russian Navy put a fully autonomous nuclear capable drone ship and park it off the coast of about 200 miles off the coast of New York quite a number of years ago. Anduril is now trying to produce fully autonomous robotic submarines for the US Navy at a new plant in Ohio because again one of the problems that America has when they're trying to overmatch China from a military perspective is China can make a million of anything like that. America can make a hundred things quite slowly. Um, so they've got to catch up on the manufacturing side and we've seen manufacturing being quite the emphasis for Trump uh, now that he's back in the White House. By 2030 MasterCard want to get rid of uh, credit card numbers and passwords. So they're doing this using tokens. Uh, a little while ago I talked about Rupay out of India who managed to get rid of the CVV code. We've also seen Visa tokenizing their cards. So Visa now have more tokenized cards than physical cards globally. Um, and this is really to try to cut down on fraud. And then finally, Remember I was talking about the artificial intelligence scaling laws where you need more compute, more data and bigger models. Um, increasingly, this is Google DeepMind in partnership with the University College of London, where for embodied artificial intelligence, which is the artificial intelligences that we put into robots, self-driving cars, anything with a physical presence, you know, body, um, We've managed to demonstrate that we can train artificial intelligences with a thousand times less data. So this kind of takes us into intuitive artificial intelligences, but also zero shot and few shot learning AIs as well. So overall, bringing this kind of back to basics, when we have a look at the scaling laws as they relate to artificial intelligence, there's quite a lot changing as we start realizing that we can't just keep building 20 trillion parameter models that need the three mile island nuclear power station to power the data centers for these AIs in some kind of like dystopian flick. Um, so that's it from me. So if you if you like what you're hearing, um, then uh, let me know. Um, put some comments down below. Uh, if there's any technology that you want to hear more about, again, let me know. Uh, you can download all the books for free. So if you go to 311institute.com, uh, you can download you can download these kinds of things. So these are the codexes. This is how to build big companies. Uh, if you want to know more about all the technologies I've talked about, basically then there's 350 exponential technologies in there. Um, everything is free and uh, for anyone that says nothing good is ever given away for free then the the technology codex was just described by the US government as being the tech bible of the 2020s so thank you generals um, anyway that's it take care all the best and I will see you in the next video bye bye